Welcome to the next lesson in the module on inheritance and polymorphism in Java, where we'll work on the now familiar equals method and explore the concept of polymorphism in more depth. After completing this lesson, you'll be able to implement an equals method in a subclass, relying on methods defined by the superclass to simplify your work. You'll also be able to recognize polymorphism as a key object-oriented programming concept and apply this concept to transparently customize methods defined by subclasses in an inheritance hierarchy. Finally, you'll understand how polymorphism can be implemented by the Java compiler and Java Virtual Machine to dynamically dispatch methods associated with the subclass of the object used to invoke the methods. So let's get started with this material. Let's now consider the equals method and how we can take advantage of inheritance to write it. Here is a good way to write the equals method in a subclass, taking full advantage of inheritance. Suppose the superclass has the equals method defined in this way. If we are comparing an object of the superclass, cast it as a superclass object, and then check for further equality. In this case, we check the field x. If it is not an object of the superclass, simply return false. Now we come to writing the equals method for the sub2 class, which is a subclass of the base1 class. First, we would like to discover if the object that was passed as a parameter is also an object of the subclass. If it is, then we need to make the appropriate comparisons between the two objects. In most cases, that will mean comparing everything between the two objects that was inherited from the superclass, and then making the remaining comparisons of the fields that are found in the subclass. Here is the code to accomplish that. We set a local Boolean variable to false. If it turns out that the past object is not of the same class, the result will remain false and will be returned. If it is a sub2 object, we cast it and then call the equals method of the superclass, in this case base1, to make the comparisons and return a Boolean value of the results. We and this method with the results of the comparisons made with any subclass fields, and a final result is determined. This result is then returned from the equals method. There was a lot of information in that slide. Let's unpack it a bit by looking at the how, why, and why it works. The how is the code that we just saw. Use the keyword super to call the equals method of the superclass. The why brings us another term for your object-oriented vocabulary. We rely on the code written for the superclass because it makes things like refactoring, reusing, and debugging easier. Refactoring means that we can change implementation details of our code without changing how other users of our class interact with our code. In our previous example, suppose we want to declare two super objects equal if field variable x is greater than or equal to the field of the object being compared. This would affect all of the subclasses and the superclass as well. Presumably, a subclass object would be compared to other subclass objects using the same test. Change it once in the superclass, and no subclass user needs to make any changes at all. This is an example of refactoring. And finally, why does this work? You may not have picked up on it, but we used a sub2 object as the parameter for the equals method of the superclass. Certainly, it will make the call because all objects will qualify as type objects. But is it an instance of a base1 object? It is. Because of polymorphism, polymorphism Another term commonly used in object-oriented programming allows a subclass to take on the identity of any of its ancestor classes. In our previous example, where we were designing characters for a game, an atomic ghoul is a ghoul. This means that an atomic ghoul can be used as a parameter where a ghoul object is expected. 
This works because an atomic ghoul has inherited all of the fields and behaviors of a ghoul object. Any method that was expecting a ghoul can still execute if it receives an atomic ghoul object instead. In the same way, an atomic ghoul is an AB spike. This was the superclass from which the ghoul class was derived. Because ghouls inherited all the fields and behaviors of an AB spike object, those same fields and behaviors are passed down to the atomic ghoul class. And finally, a ghoul is an AB spike. Let's review objects and method calls before leaving this lesson. First, let's see where these calls may take place. A subclass can call any public or protected method that is in its superclass because they are all inherited. For example, code like this may be found in a class file where the method setTotal is protected in the superclass from which the class is derived. An object can invoke any public method from its superclass. Yes, that is similar to the first rule, but here I am referring to a call that would be found in a client file. My object is an object instantiated from the subclass, and the method getTotal is a public method inherited from its superclass. It must be public, as opposed to private or protected, because this call is being made from outside the class file. Here are more rules about method calls. In all cases, these rules apply to both calls made in a class file, as well as calls made on objects instantiated in client files. When an object invokes a method that is inherited from the superclass, the compiler will look for the definition of that method in its own class file. If there is no definition there, this means that the object is referring to an inherited method so the compiler will then reference the superclass of the object. If nothing is found there, then it must be a method that the superclass first inherited from its superclass, and so on. Suppose the method called is overloaded, meaning that the name of the method is defined more than once, but the parameter lists differ. The first priority is to find a method definition with matching return type and parameter list. Once again, the compiler would look for the definition in the first class file of the object, then in the parent class, and in the parent of the parent class, and so on until a suitable definition is found. Because of polymorphism and inheritance, this object can use any of the public methods found in its ancestor classes, and the subclass file can also use the protected methods. What if a method is overridden? Recall overridden refers to the notion that there are several methods with the same name, return type, and parameter list found in different subclass files and superclass files. It enables clients to write code that is very readable, like this, while invoking two different method definitions. Once again, the compiler looks in the subclass that made the call first, then the superclass, and so on. If the object actually wants to invoke an overridden method from the parent class file, that must be set up in the subclass. You might see this in something like the toString method. The subclass will most likely override this method. But what if we wanted to make both versions of the toString method available to the subclass? In the subclass file, we would define the overridden method to string along with other methods that might call the parent class version using the keyword super, and the subclass's own version, or just call the parent class version by itself. In the client file, the cause would look like this. Notice the first call to print object X is an implicit call of to string. The other two calls must be made explicitly to methods written in that subclass. A client file cannot use the keyword super to try to make a call to a parent class method. That reference must be made in the class file itself as a design decision made by the author of the class. And this is in keeping with our ideas about abstraction. Users of a class should not know what methods are native and what methods are inherited. They should just be able to interact with the object in useful ways. You don't need to know how polymorphism is implemented to use this feature properly, 
such as to create subclasses that override the equals and to string methods defined in superclasses, as discussed above. However, understanding how polymorphism works will increase your qualifications as a coveted full-stack developer, since you'll be more familiar with other layers in the Android stack and development tool chain. It will also help you to design object-oriented programs that strike the appropriate balance between flexibility and efficiency. Polymorphism in Java is implemented via the Java compiler and the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM, which contains a bytecode instruction that calls the appropriate method for an object at runtime, which is a process commonly known as dynamic dispatch. The specific method that's dynamically dispatched corresponds to the method associated with the subclass of the object used to invoke the method. This subclass method can override and customize the method inherited from the object superclass. Dynamic dispatch is also known as virtual method invocation, which is the default dispatching mechanism for methods in Java. Therefore, a subclass can override any method defined in a superclass, unless that method is declared as private, final, or static. Although the Java Virtual Machine specification does not mandate a particular internal structure for objects, a Java compiler typically generates a virtual table or vtable for each Java class. This vtable contains the addresses of the dynamically dispatched virtual methods in the class's API. Likewise, the Java compiler generates a pointer to the vtable of the class associated with each Java object. This so-called vptr, vpointer, is used internally by the JVM to locate the appropriate method in the vtable and dispatch it whenever a virtual method is called by an app. Java's dynamic dispatching mechanism is also commonly referred to as late binding, since virtual method calls are not bound until the time of invocation. In addition to supporting polymorphism via dynamic method dispatching, Java also supports static method dispatching, where the implementation of a method is selected at compile time rather than at runtime. The JVM uses this technique to dispatch Java's private, final, and static methods. For example, the static EQ method in abstract map is statically dispatched to compare whether two objects are equal. Although statically dispatched methods cannot be overridden by subclasses, the underlying JVM can implement and optimize them more efficiently than dynamically dispatched methods, since fewer instructions are typically required to invoke a statically dispatched method. These types of methods, therefore, play an important role in certain types of Java apps that value performance more than extensibility, such as time-critical apps, where the right answer delivered too late becomes the wrong answer. Now that you've completed this lesson, you should be able to implement an equals method in a subclass, relying on methods defined by the superclass to simplify your work. You should also be able to recognize polymorphism as a key object-oriented programming concept and be able to apply that concept to transparently customize methods defined by subclasses in an inheritance hierarchy. In addition, you should now understand how polymorphism can be implemented by the Java compiler and Java virtual machine to dynamically dispatch methods associated with the subclass of the object used to invoke the methods. This lesson underscores how concepts you learned in previous lessons continue to resurface as they apply to new scenarios. To refine your understanding, therefore, you should continually apply these concepts by coding your own examples, trying out your own ideas about classes and objects, and in particular, try coding some of the examples contained in recent lessons if you haven't already. Make changes and then see if you can explain the results that you've seen. Trial, 
error, and success can be powerful learning tools. We know our MOOC students lead very busy lives, so please don't code and drive. <laughs>